Hi, I'm Bill Doherty, and I want to welcome the viewers to another edition of Bill's Bullpen. Bill's Bullpen is a program that's intended to give folks here in Bourne and in the region some sense of what's going on. And today I have with me Connie Marigo. Mm -hmm. And tell me what your title is. I am the new president and executive director at the National Marine Life Center. Wow. Marine Life Center. Now, that isn't all marine life because I think it's uh, turtles and seals, right? Yes, which are actually marine animals. So uh, marine mammals and sea turtles are both from uh, saltwater environment, from the ocean. Mm -hmm. Turtles too? Yes, oh yes. I mean, those little reptiles are really seagoing creatures? They are, and they are born uh, just probably the size of a silver dollar, and they somehow navigate the oceans, and uh, it's, it's truly amazing. Uh, the size that they are, they come off the beach, they enter the water, and 15 to 20 years later, after foraging and traveling, they come back to the same beach where they were born, and that's where they nest. It's amazing navigation system, these little turtles. There was a movie years ago uh, that talked about wa you know, watching the turtles scramble, the silver dollar sized turtles mm -hmm. scramble in order to get to the water, and uh, they uh, there were many, I guess it was the, uh, the seagulls mm -hmm. uh, were the main predator that they had to face. They had to survive that. So apparently that's why I guess that uh, their parents are so prolific and have as many eggs as they do. Yes, to some degree there's high predation. Um, also uh, fox or um, raccoons, things dig up the nest and eat the eggs before they're even done mm -hmm. and uh, before the hatchlings emerge. So. Um, there's a lot of uh, predators and just uh, hazards, I guess, that these little turtles have to navigate before they even get into the water. And then sometimes just getting in the water, if it's stormy or high surf, they get washed back in, they've got to start over again. So um, there's, there's a lot of things for these little animals to navigate before they can even get out in there and start foraging and growing and that sort of thing. But your part is after they're all grown up. Well, Why do, how do you meet your turtles? Yeah, um, not necessarily. So some of the turtles that come to us are juveniles. Oh. So they are small. Um, some of them are the picture of the size of a dessert plate with little flippers attached. Um, so these are juveniles that might be somewhere in the vicinity of two, three years old. It's, it's difficult to age sea turtles. So these are estimates based on the available science. But, mm -hmm. um, and all of the turtles that come to us are injured or sick in some way. Mm -hmm. We only accept animals that can't continue on in their own environment on their own. So mm. something has happened. They're either cold stunned, uh, we see hit by boats, um, entanglements, things like that. So all those cases would come to us or our partners at the New England Aquarium. New England Aquarium, you, ha you have a partnership with them. I did not know that. Yes, I was the director of the um, rescue rehab program there for 27 years until I came down here at National Marine Life Center um, wow. with the goal of growing this program. Uh -huh. Well, that, that's, I, I think that's wonderful. Uh, now, the thought occurred to me, and I've often wondered about this, what do you do with a turtle whose shell is cracked? It depends on the severity. So uh, if it's a minor uh, crack, then you certainly can repair that. So especially in juveniles, they're going to grow. Mm -hmm. The shell is bone, so that will also grow. Oh, it, it might okay. take years depending yeah. on the type of fracture, um, but it will come together. So uh, it usually requires a veterinarian. They mm -hmm. may want to debride, or that's really a term that just means remove any of the dead tissue yeah, just uh, to get clean debride edges. Debride or debride? Uh, it's said in both ways. Okay, cause I, I prefer to bride, but okay, that's well, how I, I, I learned it. <laughs> I, I worked nights in the hospital when I was in college, so uh -huh. it would be to breed to me, right? That's right, yes, yeah. and I have definitely heard it both ways. Okay. So, um, so if they so take off the dead tissue, um, I, I, I used to do some work with epoxies. Uh, is that what they use to coat the... Uh, you know, to, to rejoin the, uh, the, the Not bone. necessarily, because uh, epoxy is more of a glue type material. It is a glue. Yeah, yeah. so um, it depends on the <coughs> fracture, but mm -hmm. sometimes you put a little brace across from mm. one healthy side to a healthy side, mm -hmm. just to help as the turtle grows to bring the, the fracture together. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it requires full on surgery, depending on the nature of the fracture. Certainly a big concern is where is the fracture? If it goes across the lower part of the carapace, which is the top shell again, um, 
did it sever the spinal column? So there's a oh, lot yeah. of investigating that has to be done with mm -hmm. um, range of motion and all the flippers. Um, and how severe is it? What uh, motion has it impacted on the turtle? Okay. Now, so folks can, you know, can realize the difference. Uh, there's turtles, tortoises, there's sea turtles. How do you tell the difference, or how would a, you know, an average person tell the difference between a sea turtle and let's say a snapping turtle that you might find in a pond? Well, to make it very simple, um, especially because I managed a hotline for almost 30 years, I usually recommend for people who call in, if they're looking at an, a turtle and they're not sure what it is, it's very quick to talk about feet versus flippers. So a sea turtle will have flippers that look like airplane wings. So if they're looking at a little turtle and it has two what look like airplane wings, then you're looking at a sea turtle. Okay. If it's got legs or feet, now it could be any other species. There are some uh, bog turtles, there's uh, red belly cooters. These are a lot of, we have a lot of species of, in, of endangered native turtles mm -hmm. here. So um, it could be any of those as well. And then you look at, are there little web toes? So for example, uh, the diamondback turtles have mm -hmm what look like limbs, but their toes are webbed, so they can move uh, pretty well in the water. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit complicated, but at least to start the process, I usually go right to the flippers versus legs, limbs, feet, that sort of thing. Now, um, I've had turtle soup. <laughs> yes, I am guilty don't of that. Don't tell me that. Okay. I don't want to know. <laughs> uh, what do they make turtle soup out of? Is it sea turtles or is it uh, bland, tur you know, uh, freshwater turtles? Uh, well, it's illegal for, to, to use sea turtles now, so the um, National Marine Fishery Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here um, have protected all sea turtles. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think pe folks need to hear that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're protected <coughs> um, because all species of sea turtles are either threatened or endangered. Mm -hmm. So one of the turtles that uh, frequents our waters here off Cape Cod is the uh, Kemp's Ridley. Ridley. And that's the highest prevalence of sea turtle that we have here, and that is the most endangered sea turtle in the world. So wow. these are very small. They're also the smallest of all the sea turtles, even as adults. Um, <coughs> but they come up the Gulf Stream, and they end up here off the coast of Massachusetts and uh, probably Rhode Island, New York, foraging for the summer. And as the temperatures get cooler, if they mm -hmm. try to use the coastline to navigate south, they end up trapped in Cape Cod Bay. So anybody who uh, lives around the Cape, on the Cape, especially if you winter here, you start hearing messaging over the radio, TV, print ads, and, or if you just like to walk the beaches, you'll see signage from our partners at the Wellfleet uh, Bay Wildlife Sanctuary, just uh, notifying the public, getting the message mm -hmm. out that these turtles are gonna start stranding in the fall. Mm -hmm. And if you find one, please call the hotline. It's, now, I, they look dead, but they're not. So okay. it's important, always call it in. Uh, do you work with IFAW too? With IFA, we do. Yeah. yeah. So uh, IFA is the rescue branch for the marine mammals. Yeah. So they do the rescue and sort of ambulance part of the the equation, and then we do the rehab. So they bring sick and injured seals to us. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because uh, many years ago uh, I was substitute teaching over at Cape Tech, mm -hmm. and one of the kids, uh, uh, a senior, uh, had a uh, commercial fishers li fisherman's license. Mm -hmm. And he had suggested that when he goes out in a dory for, you know, for day boat fishing, the seals, which can get as between 800 and 1200 pounds, okay, which, you know, which also brings up a huge logistical problem that occurs to me mm -hmm. as far as how, when you're transporting <laughs> them, uh, they would attack the, the boat. And uh, especially if they had uh, bait in the boat. Um, and they would also, um, compete with the fishermen for the, you know, for the day boat fish that they were trying to catch. So he had proposed that uh, because, and this was about well, more than 10 years ago, he had proposed because they, their population was growing that they have a season on them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because he said they also were, you know, they were attracting more and more sharks, which were looking at them as, you know, as a, uh, uh, you know, as a food source in their food chain. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, do you have any comment on that? I have a lot of comments on that. Oh, um, good, good. You know, um, back in the 30s, 40s, uh, there was a seal cull. So it was legal to uh, cull a seal. 
and then you would take the nose mm -hmm. and if you brought that in you would get I think it was five dollars might have been three dollars which is a lot of money back then mm -hmm. um, and so what happened was the populations were nearly decimated they were almost wiped out because this had gone on for decades mm -hmm. and so you know at a time when people needed the money so it was lucrative for some folks um, so the federal government stepped in because they saw a real dire need to preserve the population, what was left of it, mm -hmm. and they protected them. So it became illegal to harass, harm, shoot, you know, so mm -hmm. no more cull. And so what we see now, we hear a lot about the population explosion when really what's happened is we're getting back to what normal populations were. But of course, most of us weren't al alive in the 2030s. We never saw those type of populations. So it makes it feel like what we see now is a e population explosion. Mm -hmm. On the shark side, protections were also put into place in spe specifically for the white shark. Mm -hmm. And I think that happened much later. So the seals were protected in 1972 under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Mm -hmm. And then on the shark side, there were protections that were put into place much later. So it became illegal to take white sharks um, through commercial fishery or um, even recreational fishery. I think that happened in the early mid 90s. Mm -hmm. So now we see the sharks also uh, able to come back from you know their population challenges. Mm -hmm. So, so we're we seeing have more the, of them. No question about it. Absolutely, and I'm I'm not dodging the question that are they here because of seals that is a big part of it. They're also here because their own populations uh, were permitted to actually rebound. Mm -hmm. So um, having sharks in our ecosystem is a very good sign, especially the apex predators. So, and that's a, what a white shark is. And they are here to do their own version of culling the seals. So they are gobbling up seals like it's a buffet. And I hate to say it that way, but that is part of nature. So the sharks are here and they are one form of population control for the seals. Well, the uh, circle of life, I think, was you know exploited by Disney, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, you know in, in that way. Yes. And of course, wolves do the same thing when they when they when they cull a, a, rain, a reindeer herd. Mm -hmm. They basically are getting the ones that are lagging, that uh, are not able to keep up with the healthier part of the herd. Now, are, are seals a herd? Or a pack, they're not a pack animal, are they a herd animal? They're n not really, but they do haul out in what we call rookeries. So um, they mm. don't necessarily fish as a group like you would think lions. There's strategy there for, you know, uh, uh, attacking their, their well, it's prey. It's the women that do all the work in the lions. Yes, I noticed that too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but they do haul out, so there's sort of the safety in numbers. So it's called a rookery where seals actually will um, use the same haul out, either a beach section, rocky outcroppings, you know, that sort of thing. And when you think about you know, 50 years ago, how many, how many of us were out in kayaks or water skiing on those outer areas? There were probably populations of seals out there that most people didn't even know about. I'm sure the fishermen did because they're on the water, they see it, they're, they're out there, that's their livelihood and they know it better than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think that they're at least, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and I know my predecessors, there's always been seals here, but the protections now have allowed the populations to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've talked in a general way about uh, what the reptiles are, what the mammals are that you deal with, mm -hmm. um, and it occurs to me before we leave the before we leave the seals, what kind of injuries do, you know do you deal with? On the seals, um, there's a number of injuries. There's also something called abandonment. So um, abandonment, abandonment. Yes, if um, and a lot of that is due to either human interaction or um, it could be a young mother. But uh, the seal pups are sometimes abandoned by their mothers, which means you know they're really? when they're born they're maternally dependent. So for roughly 20 to 30 days, the mother will feed the pup, and the pup will um, almost double in size, if not more, mm -hmm. in that time. And then the mother will leave, and the pup will actually stay on the beach, either molt or then start to have to learn how to eat. It's mm -hmm. a sort of tough love weaning uh, period. So sometimes humans actually cause abandonment. 
you know, again, there's more of us now too. So seals mm -hmm. have rebounded, <laughs> so have humans. Um, and so often just walking the beach, uh, people come upon a mother and pup or just the pup. And now it's, you know, selfie, Facebook, it gets out there, more people go to that area. The bond between the mother and pup isn't strong enough that she will risk her life. She may be out in the ocean watching the pup and seeing the steady uh, flow of traffic towards it, but she won't come out and try to defend it. But the more that goes on, the longer it happens, and depending on the type of interference, she won't come back. She, she gives up and, and abandons it. The mothers actually do go to sea quite a bit, so they will go to sea and feed. So she'll go out and forage for herself mm -hmm. and then come back and uh, nurse the pup. Now, when so, she nurses the pup, is she nursing him as a mammal would, you know, uh, from, from yes. her, her, her milk? Yes. Okay, so she doesn't digest the food like a bird does and throw mm -hmm. it up. Correct, okay. correct, yeah, mammal. So uh, the pup is, is actually nursing. Mm -hmm. So I think what happens is a lot of times people will come upon a pup, they feel like it's helpless and they intervene or they interfere. Sometimes they sit and watch because they want to make sure that the moms come back, but really all they're doing is ensuring that she doesn't. It's a very emotional um, experience when you find this pup because these are, you know, f roughly 13, 14 pound tiny little animals. Often they have lanugo, which is a very long fur. It's, uh, it's extra long to keep them warm when they're um, in utero or in, in the, actually when they're first born, they mm -hmm. often still have it. So, uh, you know, it's hard when you see such a tiny little animal with these big brown eyes and it looks around, it's looking for food, it's looking for its mother. It's hard for people to walk away. It's, uh, we often okay, find- I, when I, guess, I guess what I'm looking for you to tell people is what should they do? Yeah, the best thing, and it's recommended by the federal government, is to view from a distance. If the mother can see you, if you, well, if you can see the pup, the mother can see you. That's the rule. Okay. So you're supposed to observe from a distance of at least 150 feet, which is roughly, I think, three school bus lengths. Mm -hmm. um, but you should be farther away because, again, they're wild animals. They can carry disease. They can bite. But we don't want to risk, especially when it's a pup, you don't want to risk abandonment because then they end up coming to a facility like ours mm -hmm. and um, you know it's it's invasive we have to collect blood we have to tube feed it so now we have to put a tube down into mm -hmm. its stomach four times a day just to feed it with mm -hmm. a um, you know a, a, a product that's trying to mimic the mother's mm -hmm. milk um, so it's you know it's best if they can stay out in the wild so if you see a seal it's best to just stay away from it Call it in if you're concerned, because again, I understand it's very emotional, especially if it's a little one. But um, it's best to not intervene. Call the experts, and they'll come out. They'll do a visual assessment, often usually through binoculars. Mm -hmm. And you're looking for body weight. You're looking to see if the eyes, nose, mouth, ears are clear, okay. or is there any colored discharge. Seals don't have return tear ducts like we do. So, uh, you know, sometimes you'll see the little wet patches around the eyes, sort of a raccoon effect. And that's a good sign. That's a sign of hydration. If they don't have that and there's crusting or green um, sort of um, mucusy, uh, um, com mucus mm -hmm. coming from the eyes, then that, that may indicate that it's not getting uh, the fluids that it needs or might be some other problem. But mm -hmm. the experts will come out and they'll help determine that. Best thing to do always is call, do not approach. Well, the, the next thing that occurs to me is that um, my, my son-in-law is a natural resource officer here in, you know, in town. Mm -hmm. And um, do you work with them? We do. Um, it depends on the situation, mm -hmm. um, but certainly they've had to help us. Um, but this was prior to uh, my coming to National Marine Life Center. National Marine Life Center is the hospital, so we don't respond on the beach unless requested by one of the beach groups. So, but in my past, um, I have definitely worked with natural resource officers, especially if it's a, um, a species we need the help or we need help keeping the public away. It's even illegal to approach or interfere with a dead marine mammal. So sometimes having uh, an official there with a uniform uh, really helps us control the crowd. If there's a crowd, for example, a, a deceased large whale, people flock down to see it. And um, you know, again, mm -hmm. if it's dead, there's probably a reason why. So you don't want to interfere. You don't want to touch um, okay. these animals. And it brings up a practical matter if, uh if a seal is dead on private property, 
there is an issue of uh, the town doesn't have the right to go on that private property to retrieve it. And I believe that some of the, uh, isn't there an agency that evaluates, uh, uh, you know, what the seal or what the animal has died from? Okay, but that person or that agency doesn't take responsibility for removal, just for testing. So that's one, you know, I think that's one of the points that, you know, has to be made that yes. if you do end up with something on your property, you're responsible for it, just in the same ways when a tree from your neighbor falls on your property, you're responsible for, for its removal. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? It is accurate, um, but again, it's always good to call the officials because they may be able to help in some way or make recommendations. Um, if it's a larger animal, um, now you, you may have a health you know, situation. You, if it's just going to sort of mm -hmm. decay there on the beach over a course of months, mm -hmm. then some towns will actually work with you and they will help. Um, if it's, for example, let's just say it's, a, it's a, one of the great whales, so then some of the science organizations like IFAR or the aquarium or some of these other groups would actually want to come out and dissect it. And if, I do that, if they do that, they will help with the removal process. They'll work with you. So if it's a smaller animal like a seal, yes, they cannot collect every seal, every deceased animal but they will at least collect some biological information. They won't open it, they mm -hmm. won't run tests, but they will collect measurements, uh, the sex, species, age class, some of the basics things, um, and all of that information is fed up to the federal government to help with a monitoring program for these animals. Now, let's talk a little bit about where you work. <laughs> okay. you, you have a hospital, mm -hmm. okay, and, I, and it's in Buzzard Bay which probably should have been named Osprey Bay because I don't think there are any buzzards I in Buzzard Bay. I think that's true. <laughs> that's an, but that's another story for another time. Exactly. Okay. But uh, talk a little bit about uh, the facility. Uh, can people access it? Do you, you know, do you run programs? Those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, the, the primary goal is the hospital, mm -hmm. but um, our, our, we also have a mission to educate. Mm -hmm. We have a small discovery center that it used to be open seven days a week. When COVID came, um, oh, yeah. that stopped. That's so, been awful, yeah. Yeah, so um, we are working our way back to having it open. So we will be open this summer. Um, but we have a, a lot of work to do. The Discovery Center is a little bit dated. And um, so I'm doing some grant writing now to try to uh, secure some funding to actually improve the exhibits, um, put in some conservation learning panels, and talk about interactions between seals and sharks. Okay. And, and by and the way, seals. don't be don't be bashful about asking for money, you know, <laughs> because uh, you know one of the things that these kind of programs do they do generate interest. Yes. So if somebody wanted to help you with that sort of thing, how would they get in touch with you? Yeah. Well, we do have um, a pr our website is the best way. Can um, go right onto the website. We have a how to get involved. Um, there's donation information on okay. how to donate. Um, certainly, you can call our number, which is also located right on the website. It's mm -hmm. nmlc.org. Mm -hmm. um, and we are looking for more funders. We're mm -hmm. looking for more support. We want to grow. We, we need some change. You and do know that you, uh, the history of that building, I think it was a garage. It was a Grossman's. Grossman's too? It, it was a Grossman's, oh. yes. The original property, I think, was a, um, it was a, a mobile, maybe? It was a... a um, Fuel station. Yeah. They had the, ta Gas the station, big yeah. tanks, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and then I think it was a Grossman. So mm -hmm. when I was a kid uh, driving from Holliston, Mass, down to see my grandparents in Yarmouth, it was before the 25 connection. And so you had to get off and drive right down Main Street in Buzzards yes, Bay. Yes, we all and remember there that. There was the Grossman's. Yeah. <laughs> so and that was a landmark for mm -hmm. my siblings and I. Like, yeah. oh, here we are, orange building. And so. Um, yeah, and that building needs a lot of work. So we've we've got a lot of um, fundraising ahead of us to make the changes that we want to make and and grow. It's uh, as I recall, I haven't been in the building for several years, but as I recall, uh, uh, it was sort of dark inside there. It's a lot. There's a lot of concrete, and you know, uh, you you have the smell of the sea because that's you know it's a <laughs> it's a salt water and you know environment, and um, but. Uh, I do know that all the people you know that I had met, and uh, you know I had to go there for official reasons, mm -hmm. um, were all very cheerful and very knowledgeable, mm -hmm. and uh, and very excited about being being participants in that. Uh, I th I think you can make the distinction 
between what I would call PETA mm -hmm. and what you do. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what is that distinction? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you know, we are advocates as they are, yeah. um, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. And one, one of our goals is to also teach people about their own behavior and how that affects the oceans. Ah. So, and, and that's important. We as humans tend to be a little defensive and We're we- We're the top we, of the food chain. Yeah, exactly. And all the other species on this planet, in my opinion, together have not affected the planet the way we as humans have. We have changed the planet in a way that's making it sometimes hostile for some species to survive. So, you know, it's the key for us to teach people that even some minor changes in their daily lives, um, bundle your errands, mm -hmm. use less fuel, that's pretty easy and you save time that way anyway. So, um, but also teaching people about the importance of these animals. What happens when seals are gone? What happens to the, you know, we all know the, the um, you know, the web chain there and what happens when one species removes, mm -hmm. things settle, things, it's off balance and, you know, the ecosystem is all about balance. So education is really important and one of our goals is to uh, enhance our discovery center so that we can better educate people on the importance of some of these species. Which reminds me that uh, in the beginning of Genesis, it does say that um, man was given uh, responsibility and oversight for everything, which says that we're supposed to be stewards. Mm -hmm. And good stewards uh, remember that they're supposed to take care of all of the animals and, sp and plant species and everything that they find in their environment. Mm -hmm. So how would somebody get a hold of, uh, let's say, the, the, the part of the process that would teach them more about how to be a good environmental citizen? There is a lot of information out there for sure. Um, you know, Google is everybody's friend, um, but that's one of the programs that we want to really initiate is more of this, what is our role as a good steward and what are the things that we can do? Some very simple and some might require a little bit of change, you know, but it's, it's important. If we were to picture in your own life, this is just one example, what if there were no transfer station or dump Anywhere. It's called the Integrated Solid Waste F Management Facility. Absolutely, but <laughs> let's, just, let's just work with the visual. If there were no dump and you lived in your home on your mm -hmm. property, uh, what would happen after 10 years? We all know what would happen. Now, we come to the end of all of this. What would be the takeaway you would want to leave with people? That's a great question. Um, I think that getting involved it, you know, we, it, every day we make decisions, we drive to work, we, you know, to go coffee, plastics, that sort of thing. Um, but if everybody makes one change, one decision to get involved, volunteer, help support one of these organizations, ours or others, there are a lot of great organizations out there that are educating the next generation mm -hmm. so that we don't have to really think about it as change. It's just how you live now. You think about the products that you purchase and where they go when you're done with them. So um, getting involved, supporting, these are all really important things. Sounds like my, uh, my I have a granddaughter, Elizabeth, that uh, uh, developed a sustainability program for a university. So great. Yes, we, we've all heard of this stuff a lot. Yes. Okay, so with that, I want to thank Connie Marigo mm -hmm. uh, from uh, the Nat, the National Marine Life Center here in Buzzards Bay, and everybody is invited. Go on the website, find out more about it, and don't you know? Don't be on the sidelines. Be a participant. Be a player. You know, get involved. So with that, I want to thank thank you for coming, mm -hmm. and I want to thank the viewers for watching another production of Bill's Bullpen, a product of Born TV.